In the early morning hours of January 2, 2018, a seemingly routine traffic stop by Officer Cheryl Dickerson of the Roswell Police Department in Georgia would escalate into a case exposing issues of juvenile detention, potential cruel and unusual punishment, and departmental corruption. The incident unfolded as Officer Dickerson noticed a golf cart being driven down a highway in the middle of town. At the uh, Roswell. At the Roswell what? Oh, there. So yeah, I asked her if I could borrow it for a few minutes. And she said, yeah, just be safe. Okay, you understand that you cannot drive a golf cart down the road. The oh, roadway. I really didn't understand that. So do how I how old are you? I'm 13. You're 13? Is that wrong? Yeah, it's pretty bad. Like a car could slam into the back of you, not realizing you're. Like to well, hold on. What do you have ID on you or anything like that? What are you doing out here, at 13 years old? Just going to Starbucks. You're going to Starbucks. Yeah. Where does your mom work? She works up in Roswell. Just at Roswell, Roswell, what? Like down there, Roswell. Where does she work? What's the name of the business? The apartments. The Roswell apartments. She like. Upon initiating the traffic stop, she discovered a young teenager behind the wheel. The ensuing interaction would reveal a series of events that raised serious questions about police conduct and accountability. During the encounter, the young driver explained that he had borrowed his mother's vehicle to take a joyride. However, he appeared unaware that driving a golf cart on the roadway was not allowed due to safety concerns. Officer Dickerson followed standard procedures for dealing with minors by detaining and searching the young driver. At this point, Sergeant Daniel Elsie arrived on the scene and took a questionable approach. He rolled down the windows and turned off the heat in the patrol car where the young driver was seated, despite the frigid temperatures. I'm not going to ask you for it. Oh. Another name. Another phone number. And the address where you live. You understand that? Please go on it. Oh, sorry. Yeah. Come on. Come on. Just so it takes a little. This action raised concerns about potential violations of the Eighth Amendment's ban on cruel and unusual punishment. The incident shed light on the complexities of handling minors within the criminal justice system. Juveniles are subject to different protocols than adults due to their potential for rehabilitation. While officers are typically authorized to handcuff minors and place them in patrol cars, the situation requires a delicate balance between enforcement and the well-being of a minor. What exacerbated the situation? He didn't say anything. He was just there in the back seat. It's warm. Oh. So you can sit over there and be cold. Cool. Okay. That's why I rolled your windows down. Oh. That's fine. And a few minutes to think about it. Should I call an 85 for the golf cart? Yeah. Okay. Let him get a little chill. Maybe that'll work. All right, partner. What's your name? Sorry. Getting cold yet, Ann? You can take it. Cool. So can I. Because I've got heat in this car. So here's where we're at. Was the subsequent lack of accountability within the Roswell Police Department. Internal documents revealed that a fellow officer had raised concerns about Sergeant Elsie's conduct shortly after the incident, but no immediate action was taken. Despite evidence of misconduct, Sergeant Elsie remained unpunished and was even awarded Supervisor of the Year a few months later. The lack of responsiveness to misconduct highlighted deeper issues within the department, including corruption and a lack of internal oversight. The incident also underscored the importance of external accountability. The local news team intervened by requesting the body camera footage of the incident. Their involvement prompted action and an investigation into Sergeant Elsie's conduct, which led to his eventual placement on administrative leave. The fact that external media pressure was necessary to initiate an investigation speaks to the broader problem of internal complacency within the department. He's about to drive to the address that he gave in a home will turn the heat on in the car. It's chilly, Colorado chilly. 18 for a wrong way driver. Aw, oh, man. Oh. Is it cold in the car, you're asking? Yeah, it's freezing in there. Well, he's got all the windows rolled down and the heat off. The incident was not an isolated case for the Roswell Police Department. The department had faced criticism for other questionable actions, including muting body cameras during a suspected DUI stop of an off-duty officer, and a police canine attack that disregarded the dog handler's commands. Stay over here. 
Are they having some super secret errands? In response to the mounting concerns, the Roswell City Council approved funding for an external review to identify and recommend changes for the department. Now let's move on to our next investigation. On November 13, 2016, Deputy Zachary Morrison of the Montemorency County Sheriff's Department responded to multiple 911 calls reporting reckless driving by a pickup truck. The driver of the truck was identified as Lieutenant Brian Filipiak, a an off-duty officer from the Washtenaw County Sheriff's Office. Upon locating the vehicle and witnessing its erratic behavior, Deputy Morrison initiated a traffic stop. Morrison approached the driver's side window and requested Lieutenant Filipiak's license and proof of identification. The conversation quickly turned to questions about drinking and an open container in the vehicle. Lieutenant Filipiak seemed to evade the situation, even reaching into the back of the truck. Morrison grew suspicious of his behavior and detected signs of potential intoxication. Here's your driver's license. The reason why I'm stopping you is we got multiple reckless driving calls about you. Okay. And then when I'm following you, you're hitting the shoulder of the road. You been drinking? How many? Okay. Where are you reaching in the back for? I seen you reaching in the back. You have an open container back there? Okay, you been drinking on the way here? As Lieutenant Philip Piak refused to exit the vehicle, Deputy Morrison escalated the situation by threatening to use his taser to compel compliance. The appropriateness of taser use varies among judicial circuits. The Sixth Circuit, which encompasses Michigan, generally deems taser use reasonable in cases where individuals resist arrest physically. This context provides a backdrop for Deputy Morrison's actions, suggesting that tasing Lieutenant Philip Piak would have been seen as constitutionally permissible within this jurisdiction. What would you like me to do? Uh, just let me go. I can't. I've got multiple 911 calls about a reckless driver, plate and all matches, okay. almost hitting vehicles. All I right. get behind you. You're all right. you hit the shoulder of the road twice. All right, just let me stay here. Okay? You can't. I'm gonna ask you nicely to step out of this vehicle, Brian. My hands are tied. If I let you go, I'm gonna lose my career over okay. you. I don't want to yank you out of this vehicle. No, just let me go. I, right. I can't. We're done with that. Step out of this vehicle right no, now. Just let me go. As the tense interaction continued, Deputy Morrison informed Lieutenant Filipiak that he was under arrest on suspicion of operating a vehicle while intoxicated. Morrison proposed administering a data master breathalyzer test to confirm Filipiak's blood alcohol concentration. Under Michigan law, officers have the authority to request such a test and refusal can lead to a driver's license suspension and additional penalties. The situation further escalated as Lieutenant Filipiak persistently resisted exiting the vehicle. Eventually, he was taken into custody and transported to the police station for a breathalyzer test. This arrest a fellow cop? Uh, yes, I think you do. Why? I don't know. Just I know this over. career. I know what you go through every no, day. No, just let me go over. Why do you think I want to arrest a cop? The test results indicated staggering levels of intoxication. With blood alcohol concentrations of 0.28 and 0.27, more than three times the legal limit of 0.08. Subsequently, Lieutenant Filipiak pleaded guilty to a reduced charge of operating while intoxicated, and he faced repercussions within the Washtenaw County Sheriff's Office. The incident highlights the complex dynamics surrounding law enforcement interactions and the application of authority. Deputy Morrison's actions showcase an attempt to uphold the law impartially, even when faced with a fellow officer. No, 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 no. Out. No. We just have to. Out. No. You're getting a taser. Back up. Taser right now if you don't get out. Yeah, careful, okay. Out! Right now! St go to the front of my car! The legality and appropriateness of taser use in situations of non-compliance remain contested across different circuits, reflecting a broader national discourse on police conduct and the use of force. Ultimately, the case illustrates the intricacies of enforcing DUI laws and the responsibility officers bear when dealing with fellow law enforcement professionals. 
Deputy Morrison's conduct demonstrating an effort to uphold his duty despite potential career risks, serving as a reminder that all individuals, including police officers, are subject to the law's impartiality. The incident also underlines the ongoing need for discussions on the appropriate use of force, the enforcement of laws, and the accountability of those tasked with upholding them. Now let's move on to our next investigation. On July 30th, 2021, Officer James Reynolds of the Fort Worth Police Department became embroiled in a controversial interaction with Vlamaris Montalvo, a pregnant language teacher, which raised concerns about the balance between police authority and appropriate response. Officer Reynolds pulled over Montalvo for allegedly failing to yield to a stopped emergency vehicle and not promptly pulling over after he activated his cruiser's emergency lights. She was en route to pick up her husband from the hospital post-surgery in Fort Worth, Texas. The encounter, captured by Officer Reynolds' body camera, showcased a confrontational tone from the officer. He ordered Montalvo out of her car and informed her that she was under arrest, threatening to forcibly remove her if necessary. Montalvo pleaded to call her husband, who was in the hospital, but Officer Reynolds was unyielding. He declared her arrest to be on a cash bond, despite the nature of the offenses being minor traffic violations. Please let me call my husband. Get in the car. He's in the hospital waiting for me. Oh my gosh, please help me. Sit down for it. Get in the car, ma'am. I got 5226 coming. She's under arrest. She's going to jail for on a cash bond for failing to vacate the left the lane closest to an emergency vehicle. In accordance with Texas law, the decision to impose cash bonds is within the officer's discretion when dealing with Class C misdemeanors. Officer Reynolds' actions, though legally permissible, were met with criticism due to their seemingly disproportionate nature. Montalvo's failure to yield and vacate lanes for an emergency vehicle, while violations are typically resolved of fines. Reynolds' decision to escalate the situation by arresting her outright, rather than issuing a citation, raised questions about his discretion and response. The encounter's tone was marked by condescension, with Reynolds expressing disbelief at Montalvo's claim of not noticing him behind her. Do you have a... Where's your driver's license? This is my wallet. Is this your purse? No. Please, Ma'am, I feel silly explaining to you what's going on. You're an adult, and you have a driver's license, so you know that when a police car gets behind you, turns on the lights and turns on the siren, and I stay behind, stop. You ask me to explain, I'm doing that. When that happens, you are required to yield, to pull over and stop immediately, not five miles later. And there are consequences for our actions. When we do something good, we're rewarded. When we do something bad, there's a penalty. Your penalty today is, I'm gonna put you in jail. And that's so that you don't think you can get away with this tomorrow. You're under arrest and you're going to jail. The fallout from the incident included Montalvo filing complaints against Officer Reynolds with both the Fort Worth Police Department and the Office of Police Oversight Monitor. An internal affairs investigation ensued, revealing that Officer Reynolds had received multiple citizens' complaints previously, some unsubstantiated yet concerning in nature. Despite only eight of the 29 complaints being substantiated, Officer Reynolds' behavior was criticized as very unprofessional. You can call your husband, you can come scoot in, you're still going to jail and you can tell him where your car is. Where is your husband? In the hospital. Which one? Can he drive? Medical City for work. Do you have family there that I can no, give this key it's to? it's only him. He can drive. He just had surgery. Okay. Now I don't care. It'll be good. Do you know where I'm going? You're going to Fort Worth Jail. Fort Worth where? Jail. And I'm not accusing you of running from me. You are not running from me. You, the reason I pulled you over in the in the first place, come on up, man, was because you didn't move out of the left lane. There were two, there were three police cars stopped on the in the left shoulder. I'm sorry, did you realize? I'm sorry. It's my first time. It's unbelievable. Do this. I don't believe it. Come on up, man. Is he still going to have his surgery? He had surgery. He was discharged. Oh. oh okay. They were waiting for me. Okay. And it was in my lunch time. I'm a teacher. And what? I was during my lunch time. I'm a teacher and I was going to pick him up so I go to a you, you have a degree, a college degree. Yes, sir. And you have a driver's license because yes. I've seen it. And you're telling me. 
Ultimately, Reynolds' suspension for seven days showcased that while his actions may have been within the bounds of the law, they were not in alignment with effective and appropriate police practices. The incident underscores the need for law enforcement officers to exercise discretion, especially when dealing with minor offenses, and to prioritize de-escalation over confrontation. The case serves as a reminder of the ongoing dialogue surrounding police behavior, citizens' rights, and the balance between upholding the law and fostering community trust.